Hello and um, welcome back to uh, what forms the uh, e-lecture 8. Uh, this is the chapter on process control and additive manufacturing defects as part of the additive manufacturing module EGM 37. Um, in this uh, lecture we're going to talk about the, uh, the control of the process. So what you've seen um, just prior to this was the um, uh, mechanics of the AM from a very simplified form. You've seen how the AM250 works. So now we're going to go into a little bit more detail about what happens at each layer uh, and how the powder is uh, melted on each layer. You will have noticed that um, we are uh, jumping around through the chapters a little bit and um, this is for uh, particularly for this year to be able to give you the information that you need um, to guide you through your practical projects. Um, so we're leaving the theory um, slightly behind at the moment and moving ahead to just for the practical side of uh, working with uh, the uh, laser systems. So we're going to have a quick overview of the process. I will look at some of the process parameters that are used uh, at the level of the machine. Uh, you'll see some Ishikawa diagram uh, for input material parameters. Then we're going to go through the primary controls, uh, process control parameters, so um, the point distance, exposure time, uh, sort of the laser power, hatch distance, layer thickness, and hatch pattern. Uh, we, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the interaction of the laser and the material, um, and uh, about the melt and melt pool. Um, some of the process uh, control parameters and how they, how they affect the formation of uh, good tracks. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, secondary process uh, control parameters, uh, such as support structures and heating and plate and powder size uh, distributions. So we've seen this before, um, comes from a paper by Kreis. Um, it's just a simplification. Uh, so you can see uh, on the left hand side here, we have the wiper or powder scraper. And just in front of that is deposited the uh, the the powder that comes down from the um, from the hopper. That comes over. Uh, you can see the, the 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 powder bed area here. They call it the feed container. You've got a Z stage which drops down. So um, the laser itself is aligned horizontally at the top. It goes through a series of uh, galvanometer mirrors which uh, control the X and Y deflection of the laser. It's focused with a theta lens down onto the uh, onto the base plate here, uh, onto this area just above the powder bed. And each layer, the wiper will come across and the uh, laser will fuse the powder uh, into the pattern which is required uh, for the object in that layer. So there are various process parameters and this the, the which are similar across all machines, regardless of whether we're looking at the Renishaw specifically, or we're looking at Concept Laser, EOS, and, and other machines. So uh, the process parameters are divided up into the material side, the laser side, the scan or hatch uh, pattern side, and then of course you've got the environment in which the uh, fusion is working. On the material side, we've got um, uh, aspects such as the composition of the material, uh, the powder density, the morphology of the powder, whether it's spherical or not, uh, the diameter of the powder particles, the powder size distribution of the particles, and then of course you have the thermal properties which control uh, how effective the laser will interact with that material. Then on the laser side, um, we've got the mode of the laser, so you could have something which works as a, uh, it's either continuous laser or it's a modulated laser, the wavelength limit of the laser, the power, um, so a lot of these we're going to look at in, in more detail uh, when we come back to uh, chapter five and we look at some of the different types of lasers, for example. But powers typically um, varies for optical based powder bed systems in somewhere between 100 and 1000 watts, with the uh, state of the art at the moment being more around four or 500 watts. Um, the, the frequency of the laser, the pulse width, offset, spot size, these are other aspects which we will um, we'll learn more about um, in, the, in the coming slides. Uh, on the how we lay the hatch pattern itself, um, the, the speed at which it moves, the scan speed, uh, millimeters per second, 
um, hatch space. Um, this will be the hatch space is um, typically the distance between one line and the adjacent line that's uh, deposited next to it. The layer thickness is a very important parameter uh, and it's determined by the Z stage of the machine dropping down. Um, and typical values for the powder bed will range somewhere between 20 and 100 microns. Uh, the scan strategy, this will be how we approach um, scanning adjacent um, uh, patches within the um, uh, within the melt. Sometimes you can go up and down, you, you can do it in square patches around. Pulse distance, scaling factors are other parameters which are uh, studied uh, on other machines. The environment itself, well, we can preheat the plate, the pressure within the machine or the gases, the gas type. We talked about this a little bit. Um, we typically use argon, but there would be nothing to stop you from using possibly helium or nitrogen or carbon dioxide. And so all the cover gases which typically are used in welding could be potentially be used on their own or as mixtures. Uh, an important aspect of the reactive metals is to obviously control the oxygen level inside. And again, we talked about this in uh, E-Lecture 4. Um, and the, the importance of having the oxygen control of oxygen levels. So we can put all those parameters into a uh, Ishikawa input um, uh, diagram, and uh, this just kind of uh, links it to the machine uh, and process parameters. So at the level of the component, uh, at the level of the line, a single line, uh, what's important is the laser power and the scanning velocity. Uh, from the perspective of some of the Renishaw machines where you have an RF modulated laser, it's important to know about the exposure time and the point distance. Um, at the level of the, the plane, uh, so how you set your hatch distance and hatch patterns. Uh, as you build up the uh, dimensionality of the part through the cube, uh, you have the layer thickness, which is then in the Z direction. Uh, the scanning strategy, whether you uh, have one layer just deposited on the other in exactly the same pattern, or you can rotate them round. Um, you, if you're interested in controlling the the, uh, the the boundary of the component, you want to set uh, aspects such as the skin and the core, and, and have maybe different laser um, scanning strategies for the for the two. Uh, with the component itself, then you get to uh, when you've uh, outside the component, you need to support it with uh, support structures. You might want to incorporate lattices, and how you orientate the part is obviously very important too. So not just the um, the success of the build, but also the economics and how many builds you might want to actually put on the plate. So things to consider then on the machine side is the type of laser that you're using, uh, the environment, the humidity, the temperature, the gas flow, uh, the material that's being used. Uh, which we'll look at in a bit more detail in the next Ishikawa diagram, um, and whether or not we we heat up the platform temperature, we heat up the base plate. And after that, we have a whole bunch of other processes which will control the post-build treatment. So we can build into the actual process, uh, whether we heat treat it uh, with an annealing, quenching, we're going to have to machine it, build in some uh, holes or threads or whatever we need to make part, part of this uh, bigger assembly. Um, hot, hydrostatic, hot hydrostatic pressing is also a type of heat treatment by which we can reduce the porosity of the part, but it can lead, if not used correctly, to um, a, um, a def deformations. Uh, certainly, residual stress is one of these, uh, the, the, one of the causes of uh, post heat treatment deformations. So you have to control that before you can successfully make your part. So looking at it from the, so what parameters uh, control it from the perspective of the material? Uh, there are many uh, aspects. So the thermal properties of the material itself, um, the optical properties of the materials, uh, so whether it's reflective or not, how much penetration through powder. Uh, the characteristics of the powder is very important. Um, so there's a lot of uh, characteristics which we're going to look at in um, uh, E lectures um, seven and eight, when we talk about the powder manufacturing and the type of feedstock powder that was needed for this process. So the shape of the powder, uh, the particle size distributions, the particle uh, uh, at the level of the machine, uh, whether the powder is humid, needs to be dried, maybe through a heat treatment. Uh, and these will make a lot of difference to the quality of the part. Uh, one of the aspects here is the flow of the powder, which um, is actually not on this diagram and is also something that's very, oh, 
uh, very important from the perspective of getting the powder to spread properly across the plate. Um, obviously, the chemical uh, aspects and metallurgical aspects of what type of alloy will determine uh, how, how we set our machine parameters. Uh, the, at the level of the melt pool, uh, these, uh, the surface tension and viscosity of the melt will determine how wide the track will be, how deep the, uh, the, the well depth will be for each uh, laser scan. And that will, a lot of these will have links to the mechanical properties of the material as it comes out. So from everything from the basic elastic properties all the way up through the, the, the tensile properties are determined very much upon controlling and selecting the material, uh, the, the process parameters, so that we're taking into account all of these different properties. So what we're going to focus on a little bit now uh, is the going back to the Renishaw machine, which you've already had an introduction to in e lecture four, and which you will probably have a chance to see uh, the the Renishaw based systems, with the new Ren 400 or 500 in the labs. Um, they they have a, a, they're, they're pretty similar. But what we're going to concentrate is on the um, sort of uh, the, the process control parameters, which are mainly uh, varied uh, in these machines. So at the level of each um, scan, uh, we'll have uh, a volume area, which is the internal part. Uh, in this case, we're looking around the side of a cube, which is being built up. But this is no reason why this couldn't be some uh, random contour at any Z level. Uh, within the volume area itself, uh, we're going to see how the laser moves back and forward to basically sketch out um, and fill this area with the uh, fused um, metal or alloy. Um, we have two, looking close up into this corner here, where you can see there is, um, a, aside from the, the filling part, which we're gonna see more about now, uh, we have a, uh, an offset hatch and a border where the laser still fires around, but it, it'll typically fill the area first and then go around the border like this. Um, so we can see uh, here is the volume area and then the laser will be firing back and forward along here and then when it's finished the volume area it'll come and do a single line all the way around like that and with a different laser setting and this this is to kind of improve the, the skin or outer surface. Now, what we're going to focus on a little bit now over the next um, uh, few slides is what's happening in terms of in this volume area. And what we're going to see is that with the uh, Renishaw systems, uh, the laser is fired as a series of uh, almost single world points. So it fires it. And this, is an, this is what we would call a modulated laser. It's not continuous. Uh, and we'll have each of them is separated by a distance called the point distance, which is from there to there. And that moves down and then it'll come back in the, from the, in the opposite direction and then go back and forward and so on. Uh, the distance between the adjacent lines is the hatch spacing here. Uh, and um, the, there are various other distances here, uh, such as the hatch offset, it's typical around 50 micron, and this fill contour uh, offset or border offset here, which creates this volume border, uh, is typically about 100 micron. These, these are uh, pretty standard. Um, the laser itself uh, is, um, is is focused uh, so that it comes down uh, and it has a kind of semi-conical focus like this, so that the you have a distance uh, above and below the optimal that allows you to offset the the, the focal area. Typically, the 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 the, the diameter. Um, of the um, of the focal area, laser focus is somewhere between 70 and 100 micron. With some machines, you can fix, uh, you can you can vary this. That becomes one of the machine parameters that you can vary. In others, they are uh, pretty much fixed. Um, you can also uh, have uh, various. Um, ways in which you can build up an entire or larger areas. So uh, 
One of the most common ones is the meander laser scan pattern, which just basically takes an entire big area and uh, the, the laser moves back and forward in, like this. Yeah, and but what you can do, uh, you can also have stripes where the laser might just move like that. Adjacent stripes, each each other moving in the same direction. So this one is called meander, and this one is called stripes. And those two are the basic sort of patterns which fill the the, uh, the, the volume area in the middle, and they can be combined into checkerboard patches so that each of these patches can either have uh, a meander, and you can see an example here of one of the parts which has got a checkerboard scan pattern, and each of those inside, there, actually these ones have got uh, just simple stripes moving back and forward. So there's quite a, you can have a wide variety of different fills, um, and that allows you to um, play around a little bit with the thermal characteristics of the entire layer. Then let's have a quick look at these, uh, summarize these parameter ranges. So uh, for the point distance, which is the the, the, the time, the, the space in which one, the laser fires one after uh, the other, uh, typically somewhere between 50 and 80 micron. At each time here, uh, the, the laser is kept on for a period of time. And it's roughly, it's very small, 60 to 150 micron. Uh, the power will vary somewhere between 90 and 200. Uh, and uh, the focus will be somewhere between 70 and 100 microns. So it's pretty typical value ranges. This is actually for the volume border here, where I was pointing out. The volume area parameters are slightly different. Uh, we'll use slightly higher powers and uh, slightly higher uh, hatch spacings. Um, but typically the layer thickness will be somewhere between 25 and uh, 50 microns. Let's have a look and see what's happening at the point distance. So. Uh, so typical point distances range from somewhere from 25 to 125 microns. So, and what you've uh, you've got is the, the possibility. So the point distance is this distance between adjacent spots. You can, if you have it bigger, you have uh, less overlap. Uh, sometimes you might have quite a bit of overlap between the two. Now the point distance happens along the line. Uh, the, and the laser then stays on at a period of time at each of these spots. So together, point distance plus the exposure time will determine how the line speed, how quickly it moves. So on this particular diagram, you can see the point distance and you've got a meander hatch pattern where the laser comes down and then goes back, comes down, goes back, etc. So the line speed is determined by how far the spacing is between the point distance and how long it takes to run. So the exposure time, which I've already mentioned, is the duration of time that the, the laser spot is on at a given point. Um, the longer the exposure time, the wider the melt pool, and therefore the more overlap. So with a short uh, exposure time here, this is 50 microseconds, you might have a small overlap. As you increase your duration of your, uh, your exposure time, you'll, the, the uh, the, the the melt pool will move out and you'll end up with uh, a, a bigger melt pool, a wider melt pool, and, and potentially more overlap. So typical values uh, are somewhere in the 70 to 150 micron range, microsecond range. So the third important parameter in this, so we've had the point distance, the exposure time, the third important parameter is the hatch spacing. And the hatch spacing is uh, the distance between adjacent lines. So in this particular meander hatch pattern, where we come down, uh, then go back across, and then come back across that way, the distance here, this hatch spacing, is the distance between two adjacent lines. So again, we can vary these so that we have uh, lower overlap there. So these are not uh, typical parameters, so we can ignore these. Typically, the parameters will right range for the hatch space in between 50 and 170 micron, which with a 70 micron spot size will lead to with a smaller hatch spacing. Uh, with a smaller hatch spacing, you'll get higher overlap here. And with the larger 
a hat spacing, you get less overlap. This will be determined, by how you set these will be determined by uh, any parameters. The line speed that you're moving at, uh, exposure time, will determine how wide your spot size is going to be. And therefore, um, the, uh, it is important. I, I also, the material properties and the thermal properties of the material will determine how wide the track is going to be and how much overlap there is. And it's very difficult to predict what that is. The only way you can do this is through a series of experiments in the machine. Okay, again, this is just looking at the hatch spacing from, the, we've seen this diagram here on the, on the right already. So looking down onto the uh, laser spot, you see the overlap. So for the low, for the smaller hatch spacing, you remember you get more overlap between adjacent tracks. And with the larger hatch spacing, you get smaller overlap. Then, but then of course, this is uh, three dimensional. So if you looked at this from a cross section, that would correspond to the one on the top left there correspond to this and this one would correspond to that looking at it through the through the cross section in the three dimensions and but the same principle applies okay so we'll have uh, uh with a smaller with a larger um with a smaller hatch spacing uh, sorry we'll have the larger overlap and that overlap occurs in 3d so you can see this area in here uh colored and then also with the larger uh, hatch spacing you get less overlap and Importantly, this area here between melt pools, you have the possibility of there being a porous region. Now here are some uh, sort of some real uh, um, microscope images of uh, hatch distance variation. So you can see uh, with a very large hatch spacing here of 240 microns that there is no overlap between adjacent lines. Uh, here, 120 micron, we've started to get uh, overlap between the lines, and uh, there's a slight, uh, you can see the sort of, the, the, the lines are merging into each other slightly. And then with 60 microns, there's a lot of overlap. We're actually remelting uh, consistently as we go up. You can still see the track uh, direction, but uh, we have actually sort of remelted on the side. Uh, so this is just a, another image from the top of tracks with overlap and without overlap. Uh, the hatch spacing is very important because uh, what we find is that if you remelt too much, uh, so if you do a single bead uh, here, this is just a schematic uh, from a uh, paper by the Russians by Gusarov et al. Uh, you can see that this has got the lovely bead formation, the sort of thing, the track that we'd want to form. Now, if you have a very close hatch spacing, what happens is that you're actually remelting and so uh, that means that you're melting powder, you're pulling powder in, but then you're also half remelting the original bead here. And by the time you've done that for three or four tracks uh, adjacent to each other, what you have is this uh, sagging or um, you're no longer creating a nice even melt bead height. So that means that you have to pour more powder in, you're gonna have a thicker bed, so when that drops down the next time, uh, this was your uh, your next bunch of powder comes in, you're actually gonna have to be remelting deeper levels of powder than you actually expected, which you couldn't. And you can see that in practice here. So this is the schematic, and then this is the real thing. You can see that drop here of uh, the remelts. So getting your hatch spacing right means that you will have a more even uh, sort of a, uh, adjacent uh, profile. That's quite important to get right. Obviously, the layer thickness is very important. Um, typical layer thicknesses for us range between 25 and 50 micron, 20 to, 20, 20 to 50 micron. Um, the powder sizes themselves uh, will be somewhere between 15 and 45 micron. So these layer thicknesses will only accommodate two or three of the larger size particles. Um, and it's quite important to get it right because you, if your layer thickness is too deep, you're going to have a lot of balling breakups, which will explain a bit of, uh, how that happens in principle. Uh, but uh, and if you have it too thin, then you're actually effectively remelting the lower layer. So getting the powder level right for the specific uh, energy density or layer or the power uh, uh, density of the machine is very important. Now, 
the laser beam itself, um, um, so there's a, a MATLAB toolbox up on uh, Blackboard that you can play with, uh, which will give you uh, sort of lots of the classic uh, Gaussian type uh, um, power distributions. Um, the, the, these are some of the sort of uh, settings. Uh, so for a Gaussian uh, uh, distribution, the, um, you have the power and the diameter of the spot size, and, and you can vary it. Now for uh, the Renishaw machine that we have, uh, typically uh, you aim to have as much as possible a top hat square profile, which is defined here mathematically in terms of its distribution. And it's important that this remains as much as possible. This is the ideal situation. And then in, in actual practice, what happens is that you have something more akin to this. Uh, you can do laser beam profile analysis when you calibrate your machine, which needs to be done regularly uh, to make sure that in all areas within the base plate, you have uh, as close as possible. This is a, a, a circular profile. Um, so when that laser uh, is, uh, what is the what, what does a melt pool look like? Well, uh, very much like a welding melt pool. You have a uh, the the molten metal. So your heat source comes down, focuses on an area, and you have your molten area. And as the laser moves along, uh, it starts to solidify behind it. So that's your fusion zone. And then you've got areas which weren't touched by the laser, but were affected, that's your heat affected zone. And then you've got your area of the substrate, which is not part, part um, of that at all, and hasn't been touched. So typically it takes, the, the melt pool will take on this kind of uh, comet type um, or teardrop shape with uh, that being the direction of movement that way. Uh, with powder, we have a, slightly different that we actually uh, are pulling in powder from the side and we'll end up with a elevated uh, top part. But what we define to be the width of the melt pool is the A, the depth of the melt pool will be B, then you've got C, the heat affected zone or has heat affected zone, and then the unaffected uh, substrate material E. Um, here's a, meant to be a video, which I'm not sure why it's not running um, here. So let's have a look at this. This is a, shows you a cross section through um, a uh, a world based melt pool. So you can see the the thermal contours away from the hot spot in the in the z direction. Right. So now let's look at uh, specifically for a powder based system. Uh, these are some images from Chang and Chow. Uh, and we've got uh, the length of the melt pool, the depth of the melt pool, the width of the melt pool. This is divided through the middle part, top surface. This is the movement of the laser, the diffusion zone. So very typically the same. A lot more going on inside. Uh, a lot going on inside the uh, actual uh, melted area itself. So there are uh, in in larger enough, larger lasers we have more convection driven flows, and smaller lasers will have a lot more capillary based, Marangoni based flow which we will explain uh, in more detail later. Um, so the when, when we gather powder, so uh, what we have is denudation area around the, the melt. So originally you have a melt, it pulls in powder from the side and that leaves a slightly em uh, emptied area along the, the, along the side of it there. Um, one of the important things about uh, the when you're working with liquid metal uh, with these melt pools uh, and I alluded to this just now was that the surface tension of the melt molten metal is uh, the way and there are various surface tension effects wetting angle and capillary forces that come into play to give you the shape of the uh, bead which will eventually solidify and these are you can you can understand these uh, from the perspective just looking at water so how uh, the um, uh, droplet will um, sit upon a particular surface is based very much upon the surface tension that drives the surface 
the surface tension of the liquid to the gas, the solid to the gas, and the solid to the liquid. And this wetting angle is determined by those three surface tensions, and it will determine whether uh, a particular droplet will be uh, hydrophilic or hydrophobic. So if it's hydrophobic, it'll want to stand up, and you'll have uh, an angle of uh, uh, less than 90 degrees. And if it's hydrophilic, it's want to uh, spread and wet the plate, that angle will be um, greater than 90 degrees. Those surface tension values actually uh, lead to an effect called the plateau Rayleigh instability, uh, which was found a long time ago by a chap called uh, uh, Rayleigh and, Plat and Plateau. Uh, and this you will see with uh, drops of water falling out of a pipette, and you'll see this breakup of droplets. And, and basically the force which is holding together the droplet in, a, in, a, in a, the stream of water as it goes in this direction, uh, the surface tension is not strong enough to be able to hold it together, and it starts to break up and these uh, into a, a series of droplets. So, uh, if you have a column of water, that um, the Vatarelli instability claims that the um, perimeter divided by the length has to be greater or equal to one for that um, cylinder of uh, fluid to, to remain stable. Once and and this is very similar to our melt bead. Uh, as the uh, laser moves, ahead, uh, moves along, you have this cylindrical melted area. And what the Russians have shown is that actually uh, this does apply, the stability does apply, but actually it's even, uh, it's, it's even tighter the, for uh, a powder-based uh, melting. And where we have here the instability frequency uh, where it starts to break up into droplets. Uh, we have that the perimeter divided by the um, melt pool length should be less greater than uh, the square root of two over three. Uh, if it's less than that, then we will uh, more likely than not get a break up into droplets. And here we see quite clearly that so these are single line melts uh, where, we've, uh, where the um, investigators have changed the scan speed here from uh, about <coughs> 40 millimeters per second or uh, 0.4 meters per second to 280 millimeters per second. They've changed the powder bed thickness, but you can see this breakup of the drops here. So uh, with the higher speeds, you get a higher propensity of the breakup um, of the drops there. But your length, the length of the melt pool is higher. Um, this uh, is captured in the simulation. So here's some work uh, from uh, Lawrence Livermore showing how uh, a melt pool uh, can be continuous, but if it goes too fast, you start to get these breakups into uh, droplets that form behind. And then you can see that quite clearly here, uh, you get this balling effect and often these will run off um, into, the, uh, into the powder. Right, so that is uh, what we would call uh, one type of instability that happens uh, with laser melting. I'm now going to talk about a second type of um, uh, uh, effect that we see with melting. And um, what we're going to look at is the, this is, instead of looking longitudinally along the, um, the line of the melt, we're actually going to look at what happens into the depth. So there are basically three uh, modes of welding. It can be uh, conduction or heat welding where you have this very elliptical type um, form of the melt pool. And then we have a transition and a keyhole. And the uh, transition is defined as the point at which the width to the height becomes greater than one. And at that point, we go into a form of key of uh, welding, which we know as the keyhole welding. And it depends very much upon the power or the power density, which is dictated by the power, the laser power and the amount of time at which the laser power is on in a given location. And you can see this typical keyhole form of weld, which has gone uh, from this elliptical through to a transition. And then we get a much deeper penetration in the keyhole welding. Now, there is a reason 
uh, for this forming. As your power density goes up, um, the, the, the formation of the keel is explained by uh, the fact that uh, there's an, a vaporization when the power density becomes high enough, and this forms a plasma on top of the um, on top of the whirlpool, and the actual melt pool itself is depressed with a plasma uh, just form a vapor uh, iron um, evaporated metal ions uh, sitting here, and this plasma forms a almost like a lens that the incident uh, light from the laser that comes in uh, reflects and reflects off the um, uh, surface of the melt pool, and this leads to a um, almost like a, a, a reaction by which it is able to bore the melt. Uh, the the it, it's able to penetrate even deeper because a lot of the uh, laser energy, more energy, uh, laser energy is retained within that, so it, it creates this uh, melt pool uh, formation. So what we've got here. You can see it, uh, the keyhole uh, coming down. So as the laser moves down, it gets enough power density that it keeps going down. Now this is actually showing the porosity that's left over because during the certification of the uh, keyhole melt, uh, often that entraps gas, and this is something we want to avoid. So I've been through a lot of this now. You can find on this slide and a paper by Wayne King a lot more detail about the uh, the way in which a keyhole um, uh, weld is formed. So what we're going to learn about um, later on uh, in um, the next uh, e lecture is about the uh, how the keyhole forms itself. We're going to talk a little bit about the um, energy density which is required from the laser to transition from conductor to keyhole. Um, keyholing is something which is best avoided, as I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, as um, it can lead to a, a degradation. Um, so um, when looking at the process parameters, two of the things that uh, we want to avoid. <clears throat> uh, one is uh, too high an energy density, which leads to this keyholing mode, where we get some evaporation uh, and um, uh, additional porosity added to the, uh, the melt track. But then also, uh, the uh, instabilities uh, which are generated um, through um, uh, having a uh, too fast a movement of the laser. But we'll, we'll deal more with this later on. Um, here are some examples of some hatch patterns uh, which are used on uh, in, in select laser melting from a paper by Gan Zen. Um, and it just shows much of what I talked about. Uh, so you have your standard meander um, hatch pattern. Then uh, you can have uh, the, the checkerboard uh, with meander patterns in various directions, and then you can have even weird and wonderful circular uh, patterns uh, like the one there in C. Um, continuing with hatch patterns, this just shows uh, the standard meander, and um, again, this is by paper by um, uh, Kerberhart from 2014. Um, and here is some of the um, some alternating uh, rows. Here's another paper if you want to have a look at it as well uh, by Beale um, there from 2008. And here's a different uh, uh, material. So typically we'll use a systematic variation of the process parameters uh, and we'll use something like um, a um, design of experiments to vary these between lower and upper ranges, uh, point distance, for example, between 25 and 105 microns, we might change the exposure time between 70 and 150 microseconds. And then we might keep some of the other parameters constant uh, for a specific build, and we'll look at the properties. Um, sometimes we'll vary four or five of these parameters at the same time, and um, we'll use a design of experiment uh, formulation to optimize the machine parameters for a given powder, uh, a given alloy uh, on a given set machine. Uh, here's an example of one of those uh, design of experiments where we vary the point distance and the exposure time. Um, and we will um, have a, um, a, a bit more on this design of experiments based uh, work. Here we can see uh, we quantify uh, using 
the um, laser energy density um, so that we have um, a, a low energy density where we've got a high point distance, therefore a high speed um, with a low exposure. And then on the other extreme here, we want um, with a 174 joules per cubic millimeter represents a short point distance with a long exposure. Um, and the three cubes here are done with repeats of each other. And we'll measure, for example, density. And that will show you here um, what the result might be from an experiment like that, where we look at, uh, with the low energy density, we're looking at very low porosities. So this C12, you can see that the, the uh, laser hasn't quite covered the uh, entire um, uh, cross-section of the uh, cube, and it leaves quite large pores. The porosity goes down and the density goes up as we increase the laser energy density till we get to an optimal point up at the top of the curve, um, around about here. Yeah. Um, and that would correspond to A12 might be our best option here with uh, the lowest set of, dense, uh, of porosity, where here the porosity would be in the region of about one or 2%. And then we can see that as we increase, keep on increasing the laser energy input, that we actually start to get this more globular structured um, uh, porosity. And this is where that keyholing effect is increasing the, um, uh, the porosity. Um, so another example of uh, what the tracks, if you look at the tracks, might look like here we've varied the power and the exposure time so we give a higher power 100 watt 150 watt or 200 watt and then we increase the exposure time and you can see that um, you can almost have the very distinct laser spot worlds uh, without much overlap between the adjacent tracks as the uh, power goes up um, we start to get uh, a mixing of the tracks so that we're actually joining up so this is going this way, and then that's coming back this way. And you can see that um, we've actually got an overlap now, <clears throat> even though the hatch spacing is uh, relatively wide. And again, that becomes even more um, exaggerated uh, as we keep the laser on for longer. You can see a very smeared out melt pool um, as, it, um, uh, as, as the laser moves um, along and the tracks are fully uh, interacting with each other. Um, so one of the other parameters that we will change will be the, the base plate. So that will be heated and there's a, a paper by Kempem 2013 on the effects of uh, preheating the base plate. And with this, we um, this shows that for particularly for uh, higher scan speed rates, you're able to get higher densities uh, when you've preheated the base plate. They've gone up to 200 degrees. Our base plates go up to only uh, 170 degrees. Um, but you can avoid um, sort of cracking and various uh, in-situ in process-based uh, defects by preheating. That's something we tend to keep on. Uh, it, it can also be shown uh, that they will have, uh, by preheating, you can improve the mechanical properties of the parts which are built. Uh, and it also reduces the residual stress, and it's particularly the residual stress that we're very interested in reducing in parts. We will tend to keep our um, uh, heater on. So that's the end of E Lecture 8. Um, you can find a test date on Blackboard, um, uh, and I encourage you to go and have a go at that. I'll ask you a few questions about this, just so they keep it fresh in your mind. Um, I hope you've enjoyed, and uh, I'll see you again. Bye.